purpose of this panel is to consider the underlying technical innovations required, right? And so uh, we have three panelists, and I'll start off. I'm, I'm from UVA. I'm co-director of Wireless Health Center. Amani uh, Shrivastava from UCLA will go next, and he does a lot on mobile health. He also does a lot of work on network embedded systems. And then Anand Day from CMU will be third, and he works in HCI and does uh, kind of ambient intelligence, machine learning, and so I think it's a, a fairly broad spectrum. Uh, the basic discussion questions we really have here is, okay, what is the underlying technical problems that have to be solved? in the sensing actuation and integration. Based related question is what's missing or what's the limits of te current technology? Right. And we're going to give examples and hopefully in the discussion many, many other research questions will come out. I'm going to limit my comments to just a few types of questions. I actually have many others, but you know, we only have roughly 10 minutes each. So. Before I start, though, I want one slide on saying that this kind of program, I think, really has to somehow create a true partnership between the medical and the technical. And what we see from our technical side is we would love to be developing technical solutions informed by the medical problems. Right? So the requirements that you have from the medical side will inform us rather than us, as someone said this morning, we build some technology and we hand it to you and we say, try it, you know, and they say, well, the old person can't do this, they can't do that, right? So we need more requirements coming down. But we must have research on both levels for an effective program. If we have only research on the medical side and consider us to be a service, just take our technology and use it and then do nice, interesting medical work, that's fine and that's important. And to me, that, that's pilot programs that NIH does already, right? And so what we want to look at, I think, is the future and how in the future we need to build new technologies that aren't there yet that are gonna be helpful to solve this aging in place problem. Okay, so I'm gonna just talk about two, two issues. The first I'll call requirements and the second realisms. And the requirements, we, we, list, we looked at this morning that we are interested in activities of daily living of different kinds and there's been lots and lots of work that have produced systems that monitor the elderly, collect information and decide what their normal behavior is, right? And then if you have changes in that normal behavior, it may be due to medical conditions. But what is the accuracy requirement for the ADLs? I don't think we know and for example, what accuracy on toilet visits do we need before we can actually say that somebody has prostate problems? Or what ac accuracy on quality of sleep do we need before we can say that this is one metric, say, contributing to a depression? And it's really weird to build technology when we don't have requirements. <laughs> and we just, in a sense, I th believe that the current approach is try to do this kind of recognition of activity of daily living as best we can and try to improve it without matching it to what the real requirements are. I'll say a little bit more about that in the realisms. So for example, if we put these systems in the home trying to help people, the first thing is human behaviors are not simple. Even something as simple as sleep. We can monitor sleep. There's a very large host of solutions for monitoring quality of sleep. And then you put it for a real elderly and you really are interested in their sleep patterns, right? And how they sleep. But they often don't sleep in their bed. They sleep in front of the TV. They sleep on a futon. And so if you just monitor the bed, you're getting an incomplete view of their sleep pattern. Environments are not simple. So acoustic, acoustic microphone is a very powerful modality. It's used for things like speaker identification. If more than one person is living there, you have to know which person is doing the different activity uh, and mood you can get from acoustics. But 
what we find is in acoustics, for example, there's lots of other sounds in the environment. And I've broken them up into these three categories, physiological, objects, and ambient. And these are sounds that we've actually detected when we've deployed this for real. And you know, people sneeze, they blow their nose, they're clearing their throat, burping, all sorts of things that are gonna be picked up by the microphones. And you need to be able to have solutions, signal processing, technical solutions that can still detect, say, mood or speaker identification, even in the presence of all these different physiological sounds or, or various objects in the environment making sounds or ambient sounds from, out, from outdoors. And what we find is that today, many, many current solutions exist, but they kind of only work when either the human model or the environments are assumed to be very constrained. For example, we get good quality sleep assessment if they always sleep in their bed. We get good quality mood detection if they're always right next to the microphone when they're speaking and there's no reverberation. But those are not real things, so we need to understand realisms. A uh, little bit more about realisms for activity recognition. And uh, first step is we do need, I believe, higher accuracy. Second, most people are complex, so they do multiple activities at the same time. Many of the machine learning approaches do not address that. They assume a person is doing a single activity, and they're accurate on a single activity, but that's not always true. Activities can go across rooms. A lot of solutions assume that the activity is happening in one room because that's where the sensors are. And they don't expect extrapolate that to across rooms. There could be missing data. There could be more than one person living in, in the home. So the activity, you better figure out if, who's doing the activity. So there are a lot of realities like that. And generally, the main point here is that normal behavior is very complex. Someone brought something up like this this morning, too, about human behavior is complex. And for example, we developed a system where we would try to create a, first a model of normal behavior and be as robust as possible. And most of the literature has people creating or research designs creating single models for an individual. Well, we found it doesn't work. We ended up with 12 to 35 models for each person depending on how complex the person is and what kinds of things they do. So you might have normal behavior on, uh, per day, maybe every Wednesday you do something different, or you do something two times a week, but not necessarily in the same days, or every other month, or only in the summer, or when you group, group with other people, or when you're in certain contexts, and so on. And so if you try to understand activity of daily living, and you have simple models, you're not gonna get the reality of it. And then you're getting 70, 80% say success. What does that mean? Right. And is that good enough? And related to this is once you say you think you know what normal is, then you're monitoring for abnormal. And normally what we find is people use standard statistical techniques of if the behavior deviates by one or two standard deviations, we'll raise some kind of either notice or an alarm. But this produces way too many false alarms in real, in real environments. Okay, so what we're proposing is you need something like semantic anomaly detection that takes into account that, hey, maybe sometimes the reason you're getting anomaly is the sensors are not working. And there's nothing to do with the person not working or not doing what they normally have. Or we need to combine point, context, and collective anomalies and most systems use one of those, not all of them. And then you add semantics on top of that to account for the fact that maybe this elderly person is watching their children's dog for the weekend and they're running around. The dog's running around and all the motion sensors are firing. The person hasn't gone crazy. It's the dog running around. Okay. And so, the, uh, so I want to end there. Uh, I, I didn't put this on a slide, but I want to bring up one more really important research question. I, and that is, if we put these systems in a home, what's going to be in the home? Not just the medical system. There's going to be a sensor network for entertainment. There's going to be one for energy savings. 
There's one going to be maybe another one for security. And how are these systems interacting with each other and causing each other problems? And if the medical system is trying to in intervene to, say, improve a depression uh, problem by turning on lights and opening the window, and the energy system is turning off the lights and closing the window. <laughs> and the windows are going like this, and the lights are going like this, this is gonna be a serious problem. So we can't act in isolation. These medical systems won't exist in isolation. And that incurs everything from the wireless interference all the way up to the semantics. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. Okay, so uh, I'm going to kind of touch upon two things. One is, uh, the burdensomeness of this technology um, as it surrounds us. And some of it is related by kind of a lot of experience deploying things uh, myself and um, just generally the state of the technology. So one thing is they are really a pain to deploy. Um, uh, I'm sure uh, most of you would agree with this. Um, since I found it amazing how relatively easy it has become to pair sensors with my phones, but home environments are incredibly messy. Uh, it's literal soup of network networking technologies and uh, like I've gone through kind of deploying some of these uh, sensors at home and kind of the hoops they make you jump through. Uh, it's kind of far from the experience we are used to with our phones. And not to say that phones are um, easy, but home is really, really bad. Of course, hard to use. Uh, um, I work with some of my collaborators with these chest belts and all, and I always kind of, I can't imagine myself wearing these belts for days at stretch to be part of a study. You have to pay me a lot to be doing it. I mean, it's just way, way too burdensome. Uh, some of the watches, okay, perhaps Apple's watch from yesterday excluded. I mean, they literally look like iPads tied to my wrist. I'm a thin wristed person. I mean, a two inch watch doesn't cut it uh, for me. I think these, uh, uh, these things are kind of um, hard to use. And finally, hard to maintain. Uh, uh, a lot of these things you try to sense, if the batteries are dying every two, three months, sooner or later, it just becomes uh, kind of a whole bunch of dead sensors around my home. <coughs> so these three pains, if you may. So I think the innovation opportunities, I kind of list them under making batteries disappear. And I think there's some pretty cool stuff which is happening uh, in this uh, space, but I think going back to Jack's point that uh, these are not technologies ready for prime time. Uh, a lot of research needs to be done. Perhaps NSF, perhaps NIH uh, might uh, be investing in these, or they do to some extent. For example, one is this notion of backscatter communication. Normally, in these devices, the ability to communicate costs a lot of energy. Backscatter communication refers to the fact that you use the radio waves already around us, Wi-Fi, TV, or uh, kind of being generated by some device, both to harvest energy as well as to modulate those waveforms so that you can communicate. So you literally don't need to communicate. There's a group out of University of Washington which has shown that battery-less sensors stack talking to each other. Literally, no batteries. Uh, so this combination of backscatter and energy harvesting, I think, uh, holds a lot of promise, but it raises a lot of challenges also. Now you begin to need to commu communicate and compute when energy may be coming in small bursts and at very low levels, and we don't really know how to create kind of uh, um, a seamless experience across them. The burden of use, I think the answer really lies in making sensors disappear. I don't want belts and all and uh, kind of sticking to my body all along. And I think uh, there's some interesting sort of uh, work happening in a couple of spaces. One is the same radios that we use to communicate, guess what, when we move around in that space, uh, they also cause perturbations in the radio waves. They reflect off our body, they, uh, we cause disturbances, and they can be picked up. Some, a lot of cool work is showing things like ability to detect fluid inside body, breathing rate from the Wi-Fi access point, Again, these are very messy signals, a lot of advances in machine learning and kind of our understanding of the physics has to take place, uh, but eventually I think uh, sensing has to disappear around us. Another source of signals are, uh, are smart meter type data and all. Again, uh, our activities kind of lead signatures on water usage, electric usage, and again, uh, they could be picked up um, and uh, made use of. Uh, 
a point I would touch upon later on is that the very same things also carry some uh, bad implications too, namely for our privacy, but let me come to that later. And the final answer, uh, final thing is making networking disappear. Uh, it's such a pain, uh, uh, even for those of us who are PhDs in computer science to kind of pull these things together. I think for most uh, uh, lay persons, it's really hard. Attempts happening, but we really don't know how to get uh, really a secure, essentially no configuration type thing with large number of devices. Uh, one PC, one, uh, I mean, someone gave the example of two printers and two PCs, and that's easy. Uh, my home currently, I was just counting, I use roughly 150 IP addresses at my home. Okay, now, of course, um, my home is kind of a test bed for me, but I think the day is not <laughs> far off that we literally will have a few tens of devices, even in, in these kind of settings. And how to manage the networking there, we really just, just, just don't know how to do that. Second challenge, trustworthiness. So you look at an end-to-end -end system, the vulnerabilities abound. And as we have found, I mean, just two, three weeks ago, the whole episode around photos from iCloud uh, leaking and all, I think any vulnerability that exists will be hacked into, will be poked, and I think as uh, we, we have to be prepared in this context. There are faults, sensors can get tampered with, malware of all form, unintended use, unauthorized access, uh, jamming, snooping, all sort of things happening. The thing which strikes me is that how leaky these sensors are. So just to give you an example, a couple of weeks ago, a paper at Usenix Security showed that gyroscope on your phone, gyroscopes are supposed to tell us directions and uh, relative motion. You can actually decipher speech from it. I would have never thought that. Uh, because it turns out speech waves cause little vibrations which can be picked up by these gyros and this group showed that by applying machine learning, sophisticated signal processing, they could pick that up. So um, really we need to move towards one where we can exercise control over what kind of information is leaking out of these. Uh, we should be able to exercise control over to a given group, caregiver, what inferences they are able to make, kind of an intended inferences versus not, because the adversary has access to the very same machine learning tools and all that the good guys are using. Uh, perhaps an answer, we need to start thinking in terms of some sort of a firewall for this kind of sensory information. We kind of normally just deal with emails, spams, and things like that. I think sensory information and actually actuation as it comes in, because they could be controlled and uh, maliciously uh, managed. Another issue which comes up is that our sensing pipeline nowadays relies quite a bit on third-party services. Our data gets stored there, get analyzed there. We just don't have the resources to learn the kind of models over these sensory data and the edge devices. Um, how do we enable trust in them? Uh, the answer doesn't lie in like just everything happening at the edge or everything happening just at the caregiver. We have to find ways with which these third-party things can be done. Again, hope is in sight, but a lot of research is needed. Securely delegated processing. Could we do secure processing uh, on encrypted data out in the cloud? So there is this technology called fully homomorphic encryption, which is making lots of strides. Not out there yet, still some order of magnitude slower than our normal processing, but uh, things are there. Selective sharing of information. Again, could we delegate this thing in a responsible fashion so that information from these sensors is uh, shared according to uh, the needs that we have? Again, encryption technology, something called fun functional encryption is sort of making a lot of strides. And finally, securing against what I kind of term as cyber physical attacks. Normally, when we think of security, privacy, it's purely in terms of when data is in transit, but many of these attacks can happen on the sensors themselves. The sensors is where kind of the analog hole is. That's where they can be tampered with and maliciously compromised easily. And uh, I think the answer would really uh, is that we have to think of security more than just about crypto and all. It's really about thinking of the overall system holistically even in the presence of sensors being tampered with and failing and actuators failing, could we still make sure our data decision action kind of loop, if you may, is still something that we can trust. And I think some sort of merging of security science and control science really have sort of come together. And I'm gonna hand over to Anand at this point. Um, so, I am the director of the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon, and um, I'm going to take a slightly less technical view 
uh, at research problems in, for aging in place, but um, ones that are impactful or meaningful from a human-computer interaction standpoint. So the first one is that, um, you know, Mani talked about a few different systems in research where we can collect vast amounts of data from individuals. And on the screen here, you can see a tremendous number of consumer electronic devices. Most of these are under $100, where you can collect a lot of data about people's individual health behaviors, whether it's their weight or their physical activity. Actually, most of these on here are physical activity. Um, but one of the biggest problems is that they give us lots of data. Um, so we can collect data pretty well. Um, we might even be able to interpret it as, as lay people. Um, but the tools that we have don't really support our ability to make sense of that data, and certainly they don't help us actually turn that, informa that information into knowledge where we, can, where we can make decisions based on it. Um, so most of the tools of what we get when we use these kinds of systems are interfaces that are essentially pretty graphs, right? I'm sure we have them, most of you have them on your phone, you have them on, 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 on saved web pages for the device that you use, but at, at best for most of these systems, what you get is, a, a playback of what your last day looked like or what your last week looked like. Um, and that's all raw data. There's no, con there's no contextual information associated with this. There's no ability or a limit, really limited ability within these systems and tools to support this kind of sense making I think is necessary uh, for this information to be useful. Um, so one of the issues here is that data is very much a proxy. Uh, that raw data that you can see here it's not that we care that I took, I don't know, let's pick on this one right here. It's not that I care that um, you know, I burned this many calories exactly at this, inf that, at, at this five minute interval in the day. It's that I'm trying to get a general sense of how active I am and, and maybe opportunities for me to be more active. So maybe it could be the case that I don't know, between 12 and four happens to be a very sedentary time for me. And making these kinds of realizations about my own behavior is actually what's interesting. Um, I, I erased the name of the company from these images that I, I, I stole from their website, because I don't want to pick on the, na on the company, but I just thought this was an interesting new uh, Kickstarter crowdfunded project that's coming out that's intended to be a, a wearable device for um, uh, to pe help people age in place. So it's just one of these activity trackers, as you would expect. Um, and one of the problems with it is that they, like many other companies, are uh, promoting it as a way to better understand human activity or human behavior. And so they can do very simple things like in addition to the wearable sensor, there's sensors you deploy in your environment, and they can track you as you move from space to space. And one of the claims they make is they can s notice differences in how you're in your cooking behavior. Right? And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Let me see how they do it. And, and this is what they can tell me. They tell me that I spent 30 minutes in the kitchen today, and it was a 50% increase from yesterday. <laughs> you know. I have, I have both, I, I live in uh, a multi-generation home. I have my parents um, living with me and I have my kids living with me. And uh, depending on the day, depending on whether the kids have something the next day or my parents have something the next day, the amount of time I spend in the kitchen on any given day is not an indication of how many, even, how many meals anyone's eaten that day. So w understanding that the raw data that we can get from these generalizable centers or these centers is really great and it's a great starting point and the fact that you can buy them for 100 bucks is fantastic but they're not really getting at what we want. So I think there's some really interesting issues that need to be dealt with in terms of the interfaces that allow us to, do, to make these kinds of sense making, so, or to support this kind of sense making. So I don't want the users of these systems, I don't want the people that we're trying to support to be data consumers. They really should be in control of getting access to that data, potentially generating hypotheses, being able to test those hypotheses, and having tools that actually are personalized to them as individuals, but help them make decisions. Um, because the current, so the current generation of tools certainly don't help with that. Um, as well, in addition to, so I guess I already said that, but being able to consume the information and take action. So um, just as a, an interface that may be heading in the right direction, and I'm not arguing that this is the kind of interface we should be developing, but um, you know, this is a, a screenshot of Google Finance from a couple of years back, and the c here you have this typical kind of graphs, but at least it's annotated. When you see uh, jumps in the data or, or huge decreases in the data, you start to have contextual information that allows you to make sense of it. So you're able to, uh, many people are able to use this site in order to make decisions. Um, and again, I'm not arguing that this is the kind of interface we should be building, but the spirit behind it, I think, is really important. Another thing we need to be looking at is, so it's a completely separate opportunity, are interfaces that are trustworthy. And again, Mani re uh, re 
uh, refer to this a little bit. Um, but as the as we build better algorithms as systems and computer science systems researcher and computer scientists, as either the problems we apply our algorithms to or the algorithms we build increase in complexity, um, it's going to be harder for our end users to develop trust in those systems. It used to be the case with that, um, you know. We never trusted our spam filters when it came to email, and then over time, we, they got so good that we didn't worry about it. We're nowhere near that at a stage in terms of in recognizing activities of daily living. So we, we need systems that can help individuals not form an accurate picture of what's going on behind the scenes, but as somebody else mentioned this morning, um, help people have a re enforce a reasonable mental model about how these systems work so that they don't have questions about what's going on and they don't think there's just magic behind the scenes or even ha or, and have to rely on somebody else. You know, caregivers are already, we've all talked about this before, but caregivers are already so overburdened, the last thing they want to be is IT support in addition to everything else they have to do. So we need these systems to be more intelligible, be able to explain some of their own behavior in a way that people can understand. They have to be reputable in this, from this perspective of, I'm going to trust it because it's coming from a set of sources my doctor recommended it, or my clinician, or my friend, my social network recommended it. And they need to be predictable. Um, so that, again, back to the mental model. So you can either ex uh, describe how the system works, you can use it to make predictions, or when you see behavior that's occurred, you can explain away that behavior. And those three things are really critical for forming mental models of these systems. Um, a third opportunity that we have is to make uh, uh, interfaces that are aware of our intentions. Um, so we've mostly been talking about sensing, but one of the mandates for this panel was about actuation. Um, this is not the interface that the aging population, in my life at least, is comfortable with. Not at all. My dad refuses to have a, a, a mobile phone at all, and my mom still has a flip phone because she's not cap she doesn't feel like she's capable of using a smartphone. But in practical, for practical purposes, this is the interface that they're most comfortable with. Um, you know, in, in some homes, it gets worse because you have many of these. Um, but I think, even though these are consumer electronic devices, I think there's a there's some things that we can think about in terms of research. So what should it, it, what should we what should that interface to control the environment? So we talked about human robot interaction this morning. What is the way that we should be interacting? with these humanoid uh, uh, or, or less humanoid systems? Should they be via speech? I certainly don't think they're going to be gestural. Um, but those are the kinds of things we're, try we're, we're trying to investigate and research. Um, this is another consumer electronics project, uh, product. It's, the, it's a Harmony, uh, it's a Logitech Harmony remote control. Harmony is famous for making really expensive remote controls. Like they cost about $1,000 each. Uh, and yeah, nobody would ever want, well not nobody, clearly they sell these. but. Um, the, the thing I like about this interface is it, it's much more activity, responsive to activities. So it's not, I want to connect my TV to my DVD player and have my kids play video games in the next room. It's, I want to watch TV. I want to watch a DVD. I want to listen to the radio. I want to play a game. The level of intention or the, the fact that these interfaces are goal-directed as opposed to plan or specification directed is really critical. And I think we need to think about how do we design interfaces that, that can be more responsive to our intentions and our goals. I think this is the last one I have. Um, I think we also need to, uh, there's some opportunities in moving from detection to prediction. I think our algorithms that we've come up with in our systems building and our machine learning are really good at detecting, although they could be better, detecting activities of daily living. But I think there's a lot of advantage in, in looking at prediction, in particular, um, again, taking uh, something from my own life, my mother fell recently and broke her hip, um, <laughs> and I didn't need a system to tell me that she fell down. Um, it was very clear from the screaming that she had fallen down and that, and, and that she needed help. What I really need, needed was the system that would predict or tell me that the likelihood of her of having a, f a serious fall was increasing and that she needs to move to some kind of assistive technology. So I, I really think we have the computational capacity and our algorithms are getting so big that we can start to move away from detecting what's happening in the present sense to looking at uh, likelihood of risk and how that's changing. Skip that. All right, so um, there's, I promise this is gonna be very close to the end. Uh, there's, uh, I think we also have this value proposition that's really changing. Um, for a lot, to go back to what Jack said, um, we try and develop a baseline of what individuals uh, are like so that we can design, def uh, build anomaly detectors. 
But the problem is oftentimes what's normal is when somebody's uh, a lot younger. And so we, I for many of the systems I'd like to build, we actually, I'd actually like to put them in the hands of people that are in their 30s and 40s and have them live with the technology and collect, collect information about them over time so that when something happens when they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s, we actually know w maybe what were uh, precursors of that and certainly how, they're, how, they're, uh, s how they're, um, the models of their behavior were changing over time. So um, where Jack referred to having to create you know, 12 to 30 models for an individual at any given time, given the variety, the variations in the c their kinds of behaviors, we also need to think about how these models change over time pretty dramatically. And I will end there.